Uh, doesn't even show. I mean, all right, great. Uh, uh, welcome back, everyone. So uh, we're going to be starting again um, about how to choose the right storage for our data. Take it away. Morning, all. Is this loud enough? So I'm Steve. I'll uh, talk through this. Um, on Zoom, we also have uh, Ravi Chima from our file systems team in the storage group, and in the back of the room here, uh, Nick and Francis from our mass storage team. Thanks for thanks for joining us. So, if we've got uh, questions, uh, feel free to ask or come and come and chat with us afterwards. Okay, we can get straight to the conclusion to begin with. Uh, we have a, a a big list of uh, everything we're going to talk about today. Actually. Um, Almost all of your job IO should happen on Scratch. Don't do IO at scale on CFS. Uh, CFS is best for storing actively used data. Uh, it's not, not really set up for source code. Put your Condor environments in global common software, or better still, as Adam was talking about before, in a container. If you're not using it for a while, bundle it up into biggish tar files and store it on our mass storage system, which is a HPSS system. Um, your home directory is good for scripts and source code. We have Globus, which is good for moving large chunks of data around. Even within NERSC, uh, Globus is a good option. And also it's important to have a off NERSC copy of everything that's critical. Uh, so who's good at sort of memorizing long lists of fairly arbitrary rules? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, me neither. So uh, let's... Uh, Go into a little bit more detail of why this is the case. So we've got here on the uh, on the right a a bit of a sketch of um, the large systems and networks and and yeah, con connectivity and storage systems at NERSC. So up the up the top we've got Perlmutter, and we can see a, a whole bunch of compute nodes and a, a very large scratch system. Um, down the bottom on the left we've got um, most of the the storage fabric, which includes CFS and the home directories. Uh, DTNs in the middle, and uh, then on the the bottom right, we've got a few of uh, the kind of a, you know, essential uh, NERSC services and networks, uh, including also uh, HPSS. So something that you'll notice, if you can see my mouse up here, these these arrows on the diagram are kind of indicative of the size of the data paths between things. So we've got this scratch system in Perlmutter and we've got the compute nodes and we've got a short fat pipe between them. So it's great for doing fast IO. Um, it's also, yeah, there's a lot else that's uh, very good about uh, scratch for fast IO. It, uh, it supports parallel IO, it's great for MPI IO, but it's about IO, it's not about storage. This is, this is short-term storage while you're using the data in a job. So to go into a little bit more detail, um, it's big. You've got by default 20 terabytes of uh, soft quota, 30 terabytes of hard quota. What that means is that Slurm checks when you submit a job and before the job starts to make sure that you're not over the soft quota. If you're over the soft quota, the job won't start. Uh, that's so that you don't actually run out of space and you know crash your job while it's running. If you go over your hard quota, then writes fail and you know, your job's going to fail. Uh, so it's it's big. It's also fast. It's a luster file system. It's highly parallel. It's also all flash, so it's low latency. It's got a great big fat pipe, you know, something, something in the order of uh, six terabytes per second aggregate bandwidth between compute nodes and, and scratch. Uh, it's a full POSIX file system. So it's, you know, it's, it's fully consistent. You can do file locking, parallel IO, HDF5, MPIO, it supports ACLs. Uh, and it handles both big and small files pretty well. Like it's got a, a, a not too large block file uh, block size, so you, know, you can do everything from from you know small data and configuration files, even you know building building source code if you want, uh, right up to very large parallel parallel IO on it. The flip side, it's big, but it's not huge. Like a, a full scientific data set can be hundreds or even thousands of terabytes, and and Scratch is meant for IO, it's meant for actually using during your job, not for storing large amounts of data. Uh, also, it's called Scratch for a reason. There are no backups. There is no fallback. 
if something goes wrong, if you accidentally delete it, if it's been there for too long and we purge it to make space for other jobs, uh, if there's a catastrophic disk crash, it's gone. So don't keep results on scratch. After your job's finished, save them somewhere. Uh, a few tips, uh, being a large parallel file system, you can optimize performance by setting your striping. By default, so we've got here, there's a, a QR code if you, you want to point a phone or something to capture the uh, the link, or when you look at the slides later on online, that uh, link goes to the NERSC rel uh, relevant docs page about it. Uh, so striping means that you split a file over multiple OSTs, which is the luster word for essentially disks. Um, more OSTs means more parallel writing. By default, we have it set up so that files go to one OST, and that makes sense for small files or if you're doing file per process. Yeah, so there's hundreds of, of OSTs, hundreds of disks in this system. You can have lots of processes writing at once and you know, spread across the file system. Uh, if you're doing um, you know, single shared file IO, you probably do want to stripe. So we've got some, um, some helper scripts to, to help you to stripe it uh, uh, suitably according to the size of the file. You can check what the stripe is on a file or a directory with this LFS get stripe command. Uh, and if you set striping on a directory, then new files that go into that directory get that stripe. That's new files. So if you've got a directory full of stuff and you set the stripe on it, that doesn't affect the striping of the files that are already in that directory. You're going to have to move them in and out or, yeah basically make a new copy of them to get that new striping. So you have some uh, uh, flexibility and tunability there according to your job workload. Okay, so all, all job IO should happen on scratch, pretty much. Uh, the next points here were don't do IO at scale on CFS. And what CFS is best for is for actively used data is not really configured for source code. So. Let's have a look at that. Uh, so CFS is a capacity-oriented file system. What that means is that uh, when we were designing it, when we had to choose between making it faster and making it bigger, we generally erred towards making it bigger. So it, it really is, it's, it's huge, uh, 115 petabytes at the moment. It's quite robust. Um, but the path to it, if you look at these arrows, so yeah, over here for Scratch, we've got this big fat green arrow. To get to uh, CFS from the compute nodes, you've got to go through these DVS servers and you know down through the network to here, and you've got much longer, narrower paths. So it's uh, it's not going to be as fast for IO. That's not what it's configured for. It's about storage. So looking in more detail, uh, on the one hand, it's it's huge. It's currently 114 petabytes. We've got another 33 petabytes planned to come online soonish. Um, the block size is set to be fairly large, which means it's good for storing and handling large files. Um, it's robust. It's it's really solid. There's, there's lots of layers of redundancy in there. Um, we take a, a nightly snapshot in the middle of the night of the entire file system. So if you accidentally delete your file, so long as it was there yesterday, you can just go into the dot snapshot, snapshots directory and pull it back. We keep those for uh, seven days. Um, we don't purge it. It's online all the time. It's disk. It's, it's readily accessible. Uh, it's got some kind of convenient features, such as a project can uh, subdivide its space into, um, you know, different directories for different working groups within that project, and they can all have a separate quota. So this gives uh, PIs and project managers a bit of, uh, you know, some some tools to kind of manage data. Uh, NERSC also has a, a pretty handy data dashboard for exploring what's on CFS and uh, who's using the space and who's using the inodes. Uh, it is also a full POSIX file system. It supports all those same things as Lustre. When it's directly mounted, um, which is the case on login nodes and on the DTNs, but not the case on compute nodes because on we're uh, manning the compute nodes over, over DVS on Perlmutter. So the flip side of that is configured for capacity over performance, it's still actually really quite fast, um, but not in Scratch's league. Scratch is really fast. Uh, it's also configured with a very large block size, which means it's great for large files. Um, if you've got a, 
yeah, 200 character script, it's still going to, you know, use up and need to, to load up something like half a meg at a time on the disk because the, yeah, the block size is large. So not ideal for source code, great for data. Uh, and as mentioned before, it's not directly mounted on Perlmutter's compute nodes. It's mounted via an IO serv uh, forwarding service called DVS. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, and that uh, imposes a few constraints. And probably the, the big take home is that it's uh, CFS on the compute nodes is, is not suitable for large scale IO. It's not where you wanna be you know, running your jobs. Also, it's robust. It's got uh, snapshots. It's got you know lots of uh, sort of fail safes there, but it's not actually backed up. Um, so you know, if there if there is sort of something catastrophic, or or you delete your data and don't realize until more than a week later when the when the snapshot expires, um, you know we we don't actually have a second copy of it somewhere. So it's important for you to keep a copy of uh, important stuff, you know, critical data, somewhere else as well. Go into a few options for somewhere else uh, uh, shortly. So a little bit more about DVS. Uh, DVS is an IO forwarder uh, developed by Cray. We've been using it at NERSC for a long time. Um, it, works, it works a little bit like NFS in a way. At least that's, that's how I like to, to think of it. The uh, DVS servers mount the, the CFS and home and so on file systems directly on those servers. And they kind of project it out to the compute servers. Uh, it's been on Perlmutter for you know, over half an hour, uh, half a year now. Um, we did experiment with running it without, but uh, as we'll see, there's a, a few catches with that. So, so strengths and gotchas with DVS. Uh, the big strength is that it can provide file system access to thousands of nodes. Uh, it also decouples the file system from any issues that are happening on Perlmutter. And this we um, this became particularly valuable while Perlmutter was still you know, coming up to um, coming into production and uh, you know, things were still a little bit unstable and we're getting network issues and so on. Uh, those can actually have quite an impact on the file system because the file system uh, you know, needs to be consistent, needs to have sort of locks across everything. And so by using DVS, we're able to sort of isolate those two systems so that they don't kind of impact each other as much. So it, uh, it, it gave us a lot more stability on Perlmutter and on the file system. Uh, the flip side of that, the, the, the costs, if you like, of doing it this way is that in particular, when you're doing IO at scale to a file system that's mounted in read-write mode, so it's not just that you're both reading and writing the file, but the file system is mounted capable of that, uh, that can cause some problems. Um, you can largely alleviate those by using a read-only mount point, and we have some of those. We'll talk about those in a, in a minute. Um, part of it is that DVS isn't actually a full POSIX file system. So, it's an IO forwarder. Um, in particular, it doesn't support file locking. And this is what things like MPIIO and HDF5 use. So, you know, you'll you'll see that uh, well, if you try to write using MPIIO, um, you know, in shared file on CFS bounded over DVS, uh, it's it's actually not safe. It, it, it might work, but I wouldn't do it. Um, HDF5, you'll find will complain and stop. And when you're using HDF5 on, on login nodes or using it for read only, there's a uh, there's an environment variable, I believe, that you can set uh, to to work around that. So, but yeah, it's it's not for I/O; it's for storage. Uh, also, ACLs uh, disable caching in DVS, and this can have pretty significant performance impact. So, ACLs are kind of a, a more advanced, if you like, more more granular uh, variant on the Chmod idea, where you can give people permission to view or you know, read, write your files. ACL gives it to you at a much finer grain. Um, if you're using Chmod, everything's fine. If you're using set faculty to access thing, uh, to manage access to files, uh, this does not play nicely with DVS, so, um, in terms of sort of performance. So, you know, we, we don't recommend using that, uh, on CFS, particularly if you're going to be, you know, accessing these files from the, from the compute nodes. 
Uh, there's no MMAP call. But that's one of those ones that if you if you know about it, you know about it. And if, if you don't, you probably don't need to worry about it. <laughs> so the way it works is Perlmutter has uh, currently 24 gateway nodes that are set up as DVS servers. Each one of these servers can, can work 1,000 IO threads at once. So, so that's yeah, 24,000 IO threads going at once. DVS can cache data from the file system and dramatically improve performance at large scales. Uh, and it's got two kind of modes of operation. One is read-write mode. So when you've got a file system mounted read-write, such as what CFS and home is, uh, the gateway server for, for any given file, which DVS node it goes through is, is calculated based on a, a, a hash of what's called the I node. So it's, it's essentially determined at file creation time and it's, it's fixed. It's gonna use the same server today, tomorrow, and in six months time. Um, uh, also, when you uh, when it's a rewrite mode like that, uh, DVS doesn't do any caching. It leaves all that uh, consistency stuff up to the file system to look after. In read-only mode, um, the same file can be served and cached on all of the gateways, and it's set up to keep files in cache for 30 seconds. So if you've got a whole lot of processes reading the same file, they don't have to go back to them file system to read it. They can get it straight from the cache. Uh, more links and QR codes to it for uh, nurse docs on how to, how to get the most out of uh, using DVS and how to avoid some of the, the catches. So for a bit of an example, um, this is a chart with a, from a, a scenario of using, um, uh, what do you call it? The impact of a read-write mount over DVS. So this is a 100-node uh, job using a Condor environment, which is set up in somebody's home directory. So the home directory is mounted read-write. So what happens here? 100-node jobs on Perlmutter can be 12,800 processes. So 12,800 processes all try to look at the, uh, the user's Condor directory. Uh, it's all going through a single DVS server because it's, you know, it's locked each, uh, each inode, which is the you know, file or directory is locked to one DVS server um, and it's not cached. So this poor overloaded server that can handle a thousand things at once has 12,000 things to deal with and it has to go fetch the file from the file system 12,800 times. So that DVS server is kind of drowning under the load. Um, it has some mechanisms to you know, constrain the impact to the particular uh, user that whose job that is. So it you know, tries to minimize the impact on other users. You're still going to have some impact because you've got one very heavily loaded server. But that user, you, you're going to find if you're running your job out of uh, out of home, out of a condo environment in home, it's just going to really jam up starting up if you're running at scale. It's going to take a long time. Same job running from Global Common. So Global Common software is mounted read-only. Uh, now, those 12,800 processes are spread across all 24 DVS servers, and all 24 DVS servers can cache everything that they get. So they've essentially got to go do the, do the read once, come back, and um, you know, provide that file in parallel directly from you know, within Perlmutter's fast network. There's virtually no load on the DVS servers. So, so these two graphs look like a little bit the same, but what's a bit hard to see here is that the graph on this page, the top of that graph is a little below the lowest marker on the y-axis of this graph. <laughs> they're, at, they're at quite a different scale. So you go to a read-only map um, mode and DVS suddenly everything's lightning fast. No load at all. So it's not only um, Global Common, we also have read-only mounts of uh, CFS. I think we've got a read-only mount set up of uh, the home directories as well. So the, the standard path for CFS is slash global CFS. Uh, there's also a second path, which is DVSRO for read-only. And this is the read-only mount, CFS CDERS. So Scratch is still faster. If you're doing you know, a whole bunch of reading uh, it's probably still better to put the files onto Scratch first. But if you've got like a really large data set or 
the job's really just doing a single read in of it once at the start of the job. Yeah, and or it's a data set that's shared by multiple users in your project. Uh, experiment around a little bit. You might actually get benefits by reading it from the read-only mount of CFS. I see there's a few comments in the chat or any of these yeah. questions. There's... Yeah, we'll come, come back to that afterwards. Okay, so following on from that then, uh, put Conda environments into global common software or better still a container. which is pretty much what we talked about before. So global common software is, is designed for software. It's got a relatively small um, block size. It's an all flash file system. It's mounted read only on the compute nodes. It's, it's mounted read write and you know, direct mounted on the, on the login nodes. So to say you can put files, you know, put your software onto it. Um, but on the compute nodes, it benefits from DVS caching and it's yeah, it's set up to work well with things like Condor environments and software that are you know, lots of small files. Uh, it's fairly easy to do. You just need to add a dash dash prefix into your um, your Condor create to point it at um, at global common software. I guess a, a little bit of extra background information. So Python startup involves leap. Uh, there's a whole lot of reading of um, modules and library files and so on on the disk. Uh, so Python startup on a large you know, parallel job, parallel file system can be really quite slow. Because it's, it's essentially, it's very busy. Um, lots of disk access. The read-only DVS mount of Global Common Software caches this, which greatly alleviates it. Um, just as a related tip, uh, if you've got a Conda activate in your .bash RC, every time you start a, a Slurm job, it's going to be activating that. It's going to go look in your Conda directory. Uh, you're going to get lots of uh, IO and metadata operations happening. So don't do that. Even though it's kind of convenient logging in and being already in your Conda environment, uh, putting it in your bash RC is, is actually not a great idea. It will, it will knock around your other, other Slurm jobs. Better still. As uh, Adam was talking about earlier, uh, NERSC has got quite good support for containerized HPC. I think, uh, I think actually NERSC was uh, a little bit of a, a pioneer in this. Um, so we support both uh, Shifter and Podman HPC. There's some links up here to the docs for those. Um, in those, the software's, I mean, ultimately it's on the file system, but it's in the container. So it's 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 pulled in. It's not it's not going through the metadata server. It's very probably mapped in on the, the node itself. So you got far, far less IO traffic going on. It's all a whole lot more local. Uh, this table down the bottom is a little bit hard to read, but it's from our docs page as you can uh, see that. Um, you go in for a, a closer look at that. But this is an experiment that uh, uh, somebody did a little while ago with starting a Python environment, I think it was, um, the Python benchmark on three file systems, uh, home, global common and in a shifter container and doing it between one and 500 nodes. And what you can see here is on, on a single node, uh, all of them take about four seconds to start. Um, at 500 nodes, the home directory takes four and a bit minutes. Global common software is down to less than one minute and the container is 14 and a bit seconds. So the yeah, containers are, are well worth a look, not to mention the reproducibility and so on. Uh, benefits. Okay, so what about data that you're not using for a little while, particularly if it's large data and you've got large data sets? This is where you want to bundle it into biggish, um, biggish tar files and put it on the mass storage system. Do a little bit, a few, a few uh, usage notes about our HPSS uh, mass storage system. So, the first and biggest thing to know about it is that it's tape which means it's reliable long-term storage. It's really robust. Um, it's really big, like even, even compared to CFS, it's huge. Uh, there's, there's currently around 300 petabytes in there and, and growing. Uh, it's actually got quite fast ingest, um, so something like 50 gigabytes per second ingest. And uh, I think this is largely achieved because there's a, a great big disk cache in front of it. So when you put things into HPSS, it actually first hits a big disk cache um, 
and then gets migrated to tape in the background. But that disk cache is sized to be big enough to uh, kind of keep things there for for now several weeks of retention. So if you if you put something there and you, know, you need to get it back the next day, uh, there's a pretty good chance it's in the disk cache. Uh, the flip side of that is, of course, it's tape. To retrieve it, you know, the robot's got to go down, fetch the tape, put it in the drive, spin it to the right point, you know, find where the where the tar file starts, uh, scan from the tape, read it back. Uh, the small files do not play nicely with tape. You, you want to put things in big files, and and the mass storage system mass storage system is. Uh, optimized to handle files between 100 gigabytes and two terabytes. So, so you want to use TAR or HTAR, which directly puts it into, into HPSS to bundle data together before putting it there. We've got uh, a whole bunch more kind of tips and tricks and follow these links for that. It's a good one. A couple of minutes, oh, better, better hurry through. So yeah, hey, um, use, it, use it for important data that you are not actively using. Yeah, you don't want to be pushing it backwards and forwards too much, but if you're not going to be using it for a while, it's a, it's a good place to store it. So what about dollar home? Your, your home directory is really good for, uh, for small things, scripts, source code. Uh, what its strength is really is that it's, it's quite safe. It's it backed up. Uh, it's also an all flash file system, but it's not a very big one. So it's, it's fast access. It's pretty good for compiling, for you know, running Vi. Um, it's small, small block size, you know, good, for, good for small files. Uh, there's, there's a few more levels of backup on this. There's the same daily snapshots as what you get on CFS. So if you delete something, uh, so long as you didn't delete it too soon after you, uh, after you created it, if, if it existed yesterday, you can go into your dot snapshots directory and find it. Um, just, a, just a tip, you can't actually see the dot snapshots directory. You can CD into it, um, but it, it doesn't appear under LS. Uh, also, we back it up around about once a month to tape. So, if you, you know, if, if something happens, if you lose something that you had six months ago, hopefully that doesn't happen, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's not the most convenient to get back, but it is uh, it is savable. So there's a you know, a few extra layers of uh, of protection there. Uh, it's not good for large I/O. It, it, it doesn't have a, a, a bigger bandwidth as the other file system. And, and it's also not big for large, not good for large sized things. It's, it's quite small. You've only got a 40 gigabyte, I think, quota on it. And definitely don't run jobs against it. And we suggest not putting Condra environments there either because of the uh, read write issues that we talked about before. So uh, I think I've only got about one or two minutes. Um, Globus is great for moving large chunks of data around. Um, it does many transfers. Uh, it can do them in parallel. In a lot of cases, actually, it, you know, it's better than just using scopy because it can do things in, with multiple streams. It's, it's quite convenient. It also survives disconnect. You can start a Globus transfer of something big and close your laptop down and, and the transfer will continue. And then the final thing to remember is have a... Um, off nurse copy of everything that is important. So a few tips of not, not losing data. Scratch, just don't keep it there for very long. It's, it's for IO, not storage. CFS is for storage, not IO. We have snapshots, but we don't have backups. So make sure you've got a second copy somewhere else. A good place for that somewhere else is the mass storage system. Um, but even on the mass storage system, on tapes, we don't keep a backup of that. So if something catastrophic happens, it's good to have a second copy somewhere. And one place you can have a second copy is in the mass storage system. Now it's on two tapes, but you know if a if a meteor hits hits Nursk or a yeah earthquake brings us down the hill or something, you know, the we don't have any offsite backup of it. So for for really important and non recreatable sort of stuff, um, have a copy on a different site somewhere as well. So I think that's really the, the keys of uh, how to choose and why different file systems and different storage systems are best for different uses. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm at the end of my time. Do we want questions or yeah, delay them to later? Uh, let's thank our speaker. 
Are there any questions uh, online? There were just some comments about uh, language about backups there. Uh, yep. Um, and if you have other questions as well, we have the doc uh, available. So please continue to ask questions in the doc and we'll continue to answer them. Um, but if not, uh, if there's no other questions, let's uh, thank Steve again. Yep.